Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election season is well underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, new borough presidents, many new city council members, and that's not all that's on the ballot. There's also another very important election happening in the city, especially here in Manhattan, but it's not for a city government position. There's a crowded and competitive race for Manhattan district attorney, the top prosecutor, the top law enforcement official of New York County, AKA Manhattan. It's a position of immense power and importance. The office holder makes key decisions that impact the lives of many New Yorkers and millions who don't live in the borough or even the city. Millions of people who call Manhattan home or work there or just visit the borough. Decisions of life and death, freedom and incarceration, crime, punishment, and more. This is one of the most high profile and important criminal justice jobs in the country. It's technically a state position, so there's slightly different election rules at play. For example, there are no term limits for Manhattan District Attorney. Candidates for the office have very different campaign finance rules. And although ranked choice voting is launching this year for city government positions in primary and special elections, the Manhattan District Attorney primary does not have ranked choice voting. <laughs> But the election for Manhattan DA is happening this year at the same time as all the other city government elections, a June primary and a fall general election. Got all that? It's okay if not, we're here to talk with the candidates and help you get up to speed on the race and all of your choices, especially here for the Democratic primary for Manhattan District Attorney, which is coming up in June. So we're pleased to bring you this series of interviews with the candidates running for Manhattan DA, as well as candidates for other offices like mayor. And these one-on-one -on -one conversations are meant to help you get to know the candidates, their resumes, their visions, their backgrounds, where they stand on key issues, and here, what kind of district attorney for Manhattan they're promising to be if elected. So we hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make an informed decision when it's time to vote. So joining me by Zoom for this interview is Eliza Orleans, who is a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you for being here. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. Good to see you. Good and to see you. thanks. I wish we were doing this in person, but this is now our lives. Yes, exactly. Sometime in the near future, hopefully. You're running for Manhattan District Attorney, but uh, take a couple minutes and give folks the, the broad overview of who you are, where you come from, what brings you to this race, and then we'll get into lots of specifics about the kind of district attorney you're promising to be. Sounds great. So as you said, I'm Eliza Orleans and I am the only public defender running for Manhattan District Attorney. Um, I've spent over a decade as a public defender here in Manhattan and I've represented over 3000 people charged with crimes in this city, people who couldn't afford to hire an attorney. And as a public defender and the only public defender in this race, I've gone up against Cy Vance's office and against a criminal punishment bureaucracy that is cruel and unjust. And I, look, I can tell you, I've never aspired to be a prosecutor and I've never worked as one. Um, and I know that you're talking to all the candidates in the race. So I think, you know, as you know, most of the people running for this office have experience as former prosecutors and decades of prosecutorial experience between them. And I think that they're, some of them are proud of that, but and that they think that experience makes them more qualified than a public defender like me to serve as Manhattan District Attorney. But I disagree and I would implore everyone who is listening or watching to think about what it means to have prosecutorial experience in the United States, to have played an active role in a system that is this unjust and cruel and to have held a position of power in an organization that rampantly violated human rights and human dignity what prosecutors do every day to the people like the people that I represent is cruel and inhumane and plainly wrong. And it's taken our country far too long to acknowledge that uh, that's always been that way. I think that we should not be trusting someone who's been complicit in upholding this system to change the system. 
it's public defenders, not prosecutors, who have the experience we need. And I've spent my entire career going up against Cy Vance's office and managed countless cases and handled um, you know, every aspect of the, the case and gone up against the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And I think that that is what qualifies me to be the next Manhattan District Attorney. And I um, am really grateful to be here to have this conversation with you about how we can really take on um, you know, this, this unjust criminal legal system and make bold systemic changes. So let's get into some of those specifics about how you want to change the system. If you are elected into this prosecutorial office, what are those changes? What are the wholesale ways that you're saying you'll shift the system? Um, I assume there's a big list of, of crimes you're not going to prosecute, um, but what does that look like? How do you put that vision now that you are running to be in this prosecutorial office? How do you put that into practice? You know, as a public defender representing thousands of people, I constantly saw the way in which our criminal legal system just destroyed people's lives with impunity, the way prosecutors treated people as, you know, inhuman. Like they, they use even the words that are used frequently by prosecutors in our criminal courthouse, you know, when the, whether they refer to my clients as case numbers or as criminals, felons, inmates, bodies, prisoners, even the language is so dehumanizing and it enables them to, to just perpetuate this lock them up, throw away the key mentality, which doesn't keep us safe. Um, you know, so the things that I want to do all are stemming from my experience of representing people. And that includes, you know, decriminalization of poverty, making sure we're not locking people up simply because of their, of their income status, because they're experiencing homelessness, because they're experiencing um, you know, mental health issues or substance use disorder. Um, so I think declining to prosecute a number of cases, but also making sure that we are holding people accountable who are perpetrating real harms on our communities. And I think for far too long, those who are wealthy, well-connected, have privilege, have power, have not been held accountable by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And so we need someone who's going to take over that office and restore trust and integrity by holding people accountable who are perpetrating those harms. So let's let's come back to both pieces of that. So let's start with um, the, the first part, which is um, give give folks some examples of the of the types of crimes typically prosecuted that you don't want to prosecute. And can you explain where you sort of draw the line? I assume there would be some prosecutions that would happen of um, gun violence, per, let's say, or you know some of the things that are typically you know let's let's try to separate. I guess now for the sake of this conversation, some of the sort of you know, typical street crime versus the white collar crime. We'll come back to that in, in a minute in the, in the second part. But what are what are some of the crimes that you want to stop prosecuting and stop seeing criminalized? And where do you draw that line? That was a big question. Um, there are so many elements to it. So, so first of all, I think, you know, it's incredibly important that we decriminalize drug possession, that we decriminalize sex work, that we decriminalize crimes of poverty, that we no longer use our criminal legal system to just incarcerate people who are dealing with other issues that you know we ha we're having a public health crisis and we're dealing with it through our criminal legal system you know the number one mental health provider in new york city is the department of corrections i mean you have to admit that there's something wrong with that that we're using this as a way to just cycle people through a system and not keeping our city safe because we're not helping people. These aren't people who are getting locked up forever. And so these are people who are going to return to their communities and have no mechanisms by which to address the issues they're facing. We've done nothing to help them. But meanwhile, we've destabilized their lives because whether you spend you know, three years, three months, three weeks, or even three days incarcerated, the data shows that makes you exponentially more likely to, re to get rearrested or to reoffend. And that's because you know, if even if just three days in jail, you lose your job because you don't show up for work for three days. Then you can't pay your rent, you lose your home. If you're a single parent, you're losing your kids to foster care. And so by upending and destabilizing people's lives and incarcerating them and giving them no, no mechanisms by which to deal with the issues they're facing, we are making our city less safe. So you know, by decriminalizing drug possession, by decriminalizing crimes of poverty and, and mental health issues, we will in fact make our city safer. Well, where do you, where do you draw the line on, on some of that? I mean, is it, do you draw the line where there's, you know, significant violence and, and, and uh, you know, victims who, who feel the, you know, the repercussions of, you know, significant violence or where do you, where do you draw a line of what crimes you will and, and won't prosecute? 
Listen, I think that, you know, first and foremost, we have to be clear that the current lock them up, throw away the key mentality and that approach is is political posturing that has failed to keep us safe and has um, put our communities at greater risk. So as Manhattan District Attorney, you know, it will be my priority to implement evidence based solutions that actually work to reduce violent crime starting with finding alternatives to incarceration, since we know that incarceration actually increases the likelihood of reoffense. You know, as, a, as the only public defender in this race, I have spent my entire career advocating for alternatives to incarceration for people I've represented, including people I've represented accused of violent crimes. And there's decades of scientific evidence which shows that, you know, it's really a very small number of people who commit the majority of violent crimes. and there are, you know, diverting these offenders, um, these folks who are, are accused of these, these crimes will be the most effective and efficient and equitable approach to actually reducing violent crime. Clarify that for me, if you would, when you say there is a very small number of folks who commit most of the violent crime, are you saying those are people that you want to use diversion programs with, or you're saying those are people that are the people you'd prosecute and try to, uh, have in jail or prison? Well, Ben, I think that, you know, saying that you're like going to prosecute someone doesn't necessarily mean that, that it has to be incarceration as the end result. I, I think, you know, a, a story that I often tell is about a young woman I represented. She was a teenager, um, 16 years old. It was before raise the age legislation, you know, probably about a handful or so of years ago. Uh, her name was Jessica and she was charged with gun possession. She was dealing with some family issues and her life had been a little bit upended. She wasn't street homeless, but she was staying with, with family members and um, her girlfriend. And she was found, she was caught with a gun. And the Manhattan District Attorney's Office only wanted incarceration for this young woman. Um, despite our pleas for mercy and begging for an alternative to incarceration, it was just, nope, jail. That's all we want to see. So we you know, turned to judges to beg for a non-incarceratory sentence. And finally, a judge said, okay, I'm going to allow Jessica to participate in an ATI, an alternative to incarceration. And, you know, she came back with her monthly updates with a letter from, from her program saying not only was she excelling, but she was attending more hours than she was even mandated to. She'd become a mentor to other kids. They were helping her get re-enrolled in school. And Two years later, I got a phone call from her. You know, I remember, first of all, she successfully completed the program. She was given youthful offender treatment, so did not get a felony record, you know, criminal record on her record for the rest of her life, um, but was given this opportunity. And the judge was so proud of her and proud of me and just said, you know, this is so amazing. I hope that, you know, you'll continue on this path. And I got a call two years later from her girlfriend saying, um, Eliza, we know you're super busy. I'm like, no, no, what is it? Anything, what's going on? And she's like, well, um, Jessica's graduating from high school and we have an extra ticket to graduation and they know it would mean so much if you could be there. And of course I was like, I wouldn't miss it for the world. I called the judge at her chambers. She asked if she could also attend. We both ended up speaking at Jessica's high school graduation. I made my mom actually come up and, and attend. I was like crying as though my own kid was graduating from high school. And you know, since then, Jessica has gotten an amazing job um, has just recently passed the MTA bus driver test. So, uh, you know, assuming a spot opens up, she will be uh, driving an MTA bus in New York City. She will be a, you know, transit worker, local 100. She'll be a member of a union. She'll have benefits, full pension, you know, this really amazing path. And she's also engaged and they just went through IVF and her fiance is pregnant, which is so exciting. But this is, you know, that is a case that I, I really point to because even someone who is, dealing with an issue as serious as gun possession, it doesn't mean we need to address it simply with solely using punitive prison sentences. I think there is a lot of interesting discussion happening in this race. And also, obviously, we've seen this with um, prosecutors from Brooklyn to elsewhere in the country around making much more clear distinctions between you know, some first time gun possession cases versus people who are actually pulling triggers and, and shooting people. Um, so how, how do you differentiate there, though? What is there, you know, do you have a sense in terms of the perpetrators of gun violence, not people who uh, are, are arrested for gun possession, as, as the case you just mentioned, but people who are the perpetrators of gun violence? Do you have a sense of how you would, how you would handle those incident, incidents and 
do you have a vision, you know, you're running on a decarceral campaign, do you have a vision for roughly, you know, the number of people you think should be um, in, held in city jails pre-trial? Um, well, that's an interesting question. And I think that um, the that pre-trial incarceration should be used in extremely rare circumstances. Um, I've seen the way in which people who are presumed innocent, you know, we say in this country, we have a presumption of innocence that people are innocent until proven guilty. And yet really that only applies if you have money in your bank account, because even people who are facing life sentences on the back end are able to, you know, fight their case at liberty if they have the money to buy their freedom. And meanwhile, clients of mine have sat in jail for months or years waiting to fight their case, um, even on less serious charges because they are unable to pay money bail. And so I think, you know, as district attorney, I would do away with money bail. And I think we should be using pretrial incarceration as an absolute last resort. I think, you know, the presumption of innocence should be one that exists regardless of your wealth. Um, and I think that the purpose of bail, the purpose is the stated legislative purpose is to ensure someone's return to court. And therefore, if someone is going to return to court, then they should not be held in on bail, period. I mean, I, I just think that like that's for me a non-negotiable. And I think people have had such visceral reactions to bail reform due to a lot of fear mongering that has gone on with regards to it. And I think that, you know, there's been some, some culpability on the part of, you know, PR campaigns by, by DASNY, by, you know, district attorney's offices across New York, by police forces, by the media themselves. So, you know, I think that, that really the fact of the matter is when places abolish money bail, actually they find that they are safer, that crime rates go down. So I, I think that that's something that's extremely important to me. And I'm not saying that, you know, never, but, but I do think- that Right, I'm, I'm mostly asking in this, in this case about, you know, some of those most extreme uh, instances of people, you know, accused of, like I said, you know, the gun violence that, that's happened on the street. We saw in 2020, obviously, you know, a big increase in gun violence. And, I, you know, I, I, I hear some of what you're saying about, um, diversion early on. I hear some of what you're saying about investing in, in communities, certainly to try to prevent gun violence in, in the first place. But I'm also, uh, you know, just want to make sure that voters hear from you about, you know, are there ways that you would try to take gun violence that occurs, you know, in Manhattan, um, you know, seriously to the point where, uh, you know, people who are committing it are, are not on the street? Of course. I mean, I think that, you know, first of all, I I have a gun safety expert on my campaign and we do have, you know, a lot of people advising us. And I think, you know, I'm committed to using proven methods of reducing gun violence, um, such as deploying violence interrupters, working to end the iron pipeline of guns into New York City. Like I, I recognize what a serious issue this is. And I know that we all want to keep our communities safe. That is something that is a priority for all of us. And I, I think that, you know, that's something that I certainly want to see, and I know that everybody um, wants to hear, but I just think that, you know, I, I recognize what you're pushing me to say in terms of like wanting there to be incarceration as a result of X or Y or Z, but I just think that we need to be thinking about um, alternatives and, and ways of investing in our communities and, and investing in, in programming that actually keeps us safe. Understood. Um, so let's come back to that second bucket. Let's talk about um, issues that are very often referred to as white collar crime, fraud, tax evasion, money laundering, uh, cyber crime. Uh, there's, there's a number of others that we could list. Um, what would be your approach to the district attorney's office in terms of um, going after those crimes? Do you think the current district attorney's office has been rigorous enough in pursuing them? So I think the current Manhattan district attorney uh, has really given a pass to those who are wealthy, well-connected, powerful, and not held them accountable. You know, the people who he's run in circles with. And I think that that's the fear that the, the next Manhattan district attorney will, will do the same. And I think it's time to hold the powerful and privileged accountable and restore trust and integrity to the Manhattan district attorney's office. And I think it's really important to have a DA who says no one is above the law. And I will ensure that, you know, those who are committing the crimes of power, the things that you talk about, 
um, are held accountable, uh, you know, I want to create additional specialized bureaus that don't exist currently, um, you know, that make sure to hold people accountable who are, you know, employers committing wage theft, exploitative landlords, you know, public officials, uh, you know, who are, you, who are corrupt, um, and especially law enforcement officials um, who... Say a little bit more about both of those. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that comes up probably not enough is that the Manhattan District Attorney, of course, um, you know, has some jurisdiction related to City Hall uh, and the workings of city government. Are, are there things related to that that you think need a closer look or you're just saying sort of a general frame would be to make sure to not look, look the other way there or, you know, and then also add on please about um, law enforcement too. So I certainly don't have any comments on any specific corruption that exists. And even if there were things that that potentially could be investigations, I think it would be inappropriate for me to comment on that. Um, but I do think that generally, it is the Manhattan District Attorney's Office who must be holding corrupt public officials accountable, because those are the people who are, you know, the people who are entrusted to, to be looking out for, for the residents of this city. And, and I think that in a lot of ways, uh, they've been failing. And whether that's corruption or just, um, you know, mismanagement, can't say for sure, but I think that, that that's something that absolutely my office would focus on. Um, and then, you know, in terms of law enforcement accountability, that's something that I, I has really, as a public defender, I encountered um, with stunning regularity. And that's everything from perjury in the courthouse, uh, falsifying documents, false arrests, um, and and of course the the physical violence in the streets and even when I would raise these issues with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, they, you know, there was no action taken. And I think that these examples of the chronic misconduct on the part of the NYPD really erode our public trust and harm our communities. And, and I think that really the truth is that the Manhattan District Attorney, that Cy Vance has been complicit in the continuing misconduct perpetrated by the police department and has used his power to shield them. Can you be a little more specific about what you would do? Is this related to um, instance, instances of brutality? Is it related to instances of lying? You know, how would you approach you know, sort of the different buckets that you're, you're talking about here? So it's all of the above. I mean, there have been more times than I can count where myself or colleagues of mine have had um, police officers under oath, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing about the truth? I do, and testify whether it be in front of a grand jury in front of uh, you know, a judge at a hearing or in front of a trial jury um, and be untruthful, under oath, swear to tell the truth, untruthful. And there is no accountability. And not only that, not only are they never prosecuted for perjury, but they are then allowed to be the sole witness in a case against someone else to send that person to jail or prison. And that is just to me completely unacceptable. And you know, I would establish a specialized unit that would be dedicated to prosecuting police misconduct. And I think that true accountability uh, for police misconduct is what will keep our communities safer. But I would establish lists of officers that I would not call. I would be releasing all of the, um, you know, would be fully transparent with all of the, you know, the misconduct records. Um, and I think that, you know, prosecutions in terms of the brutalization that we've seen on the streets uh, have to have to exist in order to keep our community safe. Would you just sort of re, re, uh, reallocate within the Manhattan District Attorney's Office the staff and the funding, or would you, you know, significantly shrink the footprint, try to use any funding, you know, in different ways to support as you, you know, got a community groups, diversion programs, you know, how are you thinking about sort of management of what is now well over a thousand person team, you know, let's just say roughly half attorneys and half staff, um, and a well over $100 million per year budget, plus hundreds of other millions of dollars that you have access to from forfeitures and settlements. How are you thinking about sort of managing that portfolio? Well, so I think, you know, you asked a couple questions there, but I think that, you know, one of the very important ones is about shrinking the footprint of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And I think that it is imperative that we shrink the footprint of that office. You know, the DA's office has mm -hmm. a massive amount of power and a massive budget, but we must 
shrink the footprint because that office is not keeping us safe, is not ma making our communities more equitable or healthier or fostering safety um, for everyone. But even with shrinking the footprint, the vast financial resources of that office, including, of course, the asset forfeiture fund should be used and I will use to help New Yorkers who are struggling and suffering. And I think that, you know, really we want to ensure that that people have the opportunity for help, treatment, safety for all of the things that they need. Um, and I think we need to be investing in you know, in programming and in housing and in education and in substance use and mental health treatment and counseling. And that's what will reduce crime in the city because it will keep New Yorkers out of the criminal legal system in the first place and getting the help that they need. Unfortunately, we're getting close to the end of our time. Uh, it flies by even when we have an extended, extended time to talk to each other. Just two more questions. One is, do you think at this point, um, based on what you've seen, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office should be bringing charges against Donald Trump as a private citizen um, in New York uh, for, for the evidence you've seen so far? Um, well, as someone who may be continuing, you know, taking over that prosecution, I think, again, I probably shouldn't comment on whether I think it should or should not be. But I do think that, um, you know, the person who who becomes the next Manhattan district attorney is likely to not only inherit an investigation, but but have the opportunity to do further investigation. And I think, you know, Cy Vance has been a massive failure in that regard, that had he gone through with the prosecutions of the Trumps back in 2012, 2013, rather than declining to prosecute them, maybe we would never have had a President Trump to begin with. And I think that we need someone who's fearless and who will, you know, stand up to anyone and make sure that, that Trump or anyone else who has committed crimes in the city is held accountable. Can you point to, um any one or two or three if you want, but uh, but we're in our last minute here. Are there are there one or more um, prosecutors or criminal justice leaders, uh, past or present, who you consider role models, not necessarily people you line up with 100%, but people you would point to so folks can, you know, do some more research and say, oh, that's, that's someone that she wants to emulate. Yeah, I mean, I think that really a lot of folks have paved the way for someone like me to be even running for Manhattan District Attorney, you know, as a public defender running for DA. When I started my career in, you know, over a decade ago, it was it would have been unimaginable that a, that a public defender could run for DA. But people like Larry Krasner and Chase Boudin and Rachel Rollins really have paved the way. And I think the fact that we really are at this kind of pivotal tipping point in our country where people really are coming to a reckoning with the fact that our criminal legal system is systemically racist, that it is unjust, that it, um, you know, perpetrates harms on communities, that it, it commits family separation. I mean, people talk about, oh, Donald Trump has a family separation policy on our southern border, but like your own district attorney has a family separation policy in your backyard and stands up every day in court and says on behalf of the people of the state of New York. So they are acting in your name with your tax dollars and they are jailing and bullying people for as little as taking up two seats on the subway. We, we do have to leave it there. I appreciate that. And I think you gave folks some, some good names there to look into of people who've recently gotten elected. Uh, Eliza Orland is a is a Democratic candidate for Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ben. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions from New York City voters are coming up in June and the fall. There's a lot on the line for all of us across the city and in this race for Manhattan District Attorney in the borough of Manhattan and beyond. I hope this conversation was helpful to you. Until next time, I'm Ben Max. Goodbye. Thank you.